Thank you very much. Uh, it's a great pleasure and indeed an honor to be here today and to give uh, this series of lectures. Uh, I'm very grateful to Scientific American Travel and uh, in particular to Neil Bowman for the invitation to, to do this and uh, to be part of uh, this edition of uh, Bright Horizons 16. Um, so let me introduce myself. My name is uh, João Varela. I'm a physicist and uh, I've been involved in uh, one of the experiments at uh, the Large Hadron Collider, the CMS experiment, since the past uh, 20 years. So I will try to, to tell you a little bit about that story. Um, so I'm quite used to speak to, in conference, to scientists, to my peers. I'm not so used to talk to the public, so I, I will make an effort to make this thing simple as much as I can <laughs> and uh, so you'll tell me if I, if I, I do well. So, um, so we, this, is the, the, this will be the first lecture and I've called it From X-rays to the X boson. Uh, so I will give you a, a picture of the world of subatomic particles of uh, the standard model of particle physics just to set the background. I know that most of these things you know uh, so it's just to recall and to remind you uh, about the number of things that you have uh, read certainly about already. So I will go a little bit fast uh, because I will not have m much time and uh, the, the topic is, is long. So the core of the lectures will be the lecture two and lecture three. Lecture two is at 8.30 in the morning, but don't miss that. So this is <laughs> where I will introduce uh, the, the accelerator. The, the, LA, the Large Hadron Collider and the experiments. So I'll show lots of, lots of pictures about what we did in the, for the construction of these uh, instruments. And then on lecture three, I will come to the X boson. So this is the main topic of this uh, set of lectures, uh, what it is and uh, how it was discovered uh, in, the, in, in the last year. So uh, uh, this, a discovery that was announced in the past uh, July. So then uh, I will make a break from physics and um, in lecture four I will talk a little bit about uh, the policy of science. Uh, so why society should invest in big science. I will uh, present my, the thesis that yes, society should invest in fundamental science. I will argue about that and then we may have a discussion. If some people think that uh, I'm not right then we, we will discuss. And finally, in lecture, f in the fifth lecture, I, I will present you some of the things that go beyond the X, this big boson. That means what are the open questions in particle physics? Things that we don't know, and that uh, well, we would like very much like to to know about. And uh, what are the research that we could do to can still do to to find out. So, the plan for today is uh, is the. the the one that is there, so I, I will remind you about the atom. So I will start, I will do the physics of the, the 20th century, essentially, from the atom to the, to the X boson, a, bit, a little bit about the quantum revolution, then the, the discovery of new interactions, so we, we, the, the, the weak and the strong interaction, uh, the appearance of many particles, discovery of many particles in the 60s, uh, a kind of zoo of uh, objects, and then a new order that was established, that, that means a new model of the particle that we call the standard model. And uh, finally, uh, what's missing in, uh, in this uh, standard model of the particle physics. Uh, and uh, this is where the, the Higgs boson comes from. So uh, according to Edward Witten, that is, uh, uh, according to Sam, the father of string theories, uh, particle physics is a modern name for the century-old effort to understand the basic laws of physics. So this, we feel very much like, like, like this about our, our field. So we aim to answer the two, essentially two questions. What are the elementary constituents of matter? And what are the forces that determine their behavior? And experimentally, what we do is uh, conceptually quite simple. We get particles to interact and we study what happens. So uh, to know what are the, element, the elementary constituents of matter is something that uh, humankind uh, is uh, trying to, to answer since uh, millennia. 
And uh, so this uh, graph here, this plot shows uh, as a function of time, starting uh, at the time of the, the Greeks, some 400 years before, before Christ, and the vertical axis is the, n the, the number of uh, elementary constituents. So at the time of the Greeks, there were four. It's quite simple. So fire, air, earth, and water. And this was, according to them, what was needed to explain uh, matter. And uh, then the number of uh, elements increased along the years. There were uh, the chemical... I'm going to try to point... Do you see the pointer? Where you see? Good. So um, the chemical elements were discovered, all the elements of the periodic table, and it reached uh, about 100 elements. So then the word elements doesn't make too much sense uh, anymore. And then uh, Mendeleev came, uh, the atom was, uh, the mo atomic model was established, and from about uh, 100 elements, we came down to two, and the electron and the proton. This was quite simple, so an atom with electrons and, and protons. Uh, but then, uh, well, the, the story, the disadvantage of this pointi pointing technique is that it changes the slides um, <laughs> as well. So. So then, in, uh, we are at the beginning of the, of the 20th century, and a number of other particles started to be discovered along the years. And especially in the 60s, there was a kind of inflation of new particles. And uh, again, we came to a number that was close to uh, some 30 or 40 or so. And there, then there was a, a new model proposed, the model of the quarks, the quark model, that uh, reduced, again, the number of constituents uh, to, to a number be below 10. So, and, uh, so it's around that, that period that the standard model of particle physics was, was uh, created, a new table was established, and uh, this I will present in the, in the next slides. So just to remind you um, th about the Mendeleev table, so I, I already mentioned that at the end of the 19th century, we, so uh, this table was, uh, was, was established. The first person to, to write a version of it was uh, Dmitry Mendeleev. And in the table, there were some missing elements, some holes. Uh, there was a full column missing on the right because uh, these uh, gases, helium, neon, argon, were not known at that time. And, uh, but so that means that Mendeleev predicted that according to this table, these elements should exist, and he did. They, they were discovered uh, some, some years later. And, uh, and what uh, the, the explanation of the table came by uh, understanding that indeed all these elements are composed by simpler elements, and these uh, are the, the, the protons and the electrons that make the, the atom. Later on, we understood that uh, uh, other than the protons in the nuclear of uh, atomic nuclei, there are also uh, neutrons, uh, but they, those uh, those came later. So um, now, from that point up to today, we have essentially built, or humankind, or physicists built a new table, and the, the new table is the one that is shown there, uh, and. Um, uh, and this is what uh, we call the standard model of, of, of particle physics, is the new periodical table of fundamental elements. I think that this is one of the greatest achievements of the 20th century science uh, to, to come to, the, to this point. Uh, but of course, uh, all this work was based on work from many other scientists in the centuries before. So this was built on the shoulders of giants, uh, three centers of, of physics, experimentally and uh, theoretical insights, led to a monumental scientific corpus that we call classic, classical physics. It's composed of mechanics, uh, introduced by Galileo and then developed by Kepler and Newton, thermodynamics with uh, physicists like Boltzmann, electromagnetism and optics uh, built by uh, many people at, at, at the end uh, with the, uh, the famous equations by Maxwell. So all this is what we call, what people we call today, the, the classic classical physics. And at the end of 19th century, people said very much physics is done. So we have discovered everything. 
So there are a few clouds, and uh, one of the clouds was something that was called the photoelectric effect that I will present you in a minute that led directly to quantum physics. So the 20th century, you can say that is the century of quantum physics. There were, at the transition between the 19th and the 20th century, a number of discoveries by accident at that, in that period. There is nothing special in the transition of one century to another, but by, by, by accident, X-rays were discovered uh, just at the end of the 19th century, as well as the electron. Uh, radioactivity was discovered, the fact that some elements emit spontaneously radiation, the quantum of light introduced by Einstein, special rel relativity also introduced by, by Einstein. All these led towards the start of the century of quantum physics. So the history of the standard model is something that is, uh, went along the, the 20th century. There's with, in parallel, experimental results, new discoveries, and theoretical developments. Uh, so this plot is not uh, very, very nice, but it, it shows that along, along this way there are a number of things on the left that are particles discovered, on the right there are theories being, uh, cr being uh, developed. And this, uh, at the end, uh, uh, led to, to a model, and in particular to the knowledge of the constituents of matter. So we, we, you all know the several layers uh, of constituents of matter. So we, we all matter is uh, formed by atoms. The atoms as a nucleus and, uh, and uh, electrons around. The nucleus is composed of protons and neutrons. And the protons and neutrons themselves, they are built from quarks. So these are the four layers of constituents of matter. And this is essentially a construction of the 20th century. Now, uh, the next slide are not about the constituents of matter. Those, these are about the constituents of my family. <laughs> I, so I'm showing these just because they are uh, representative of the scale of 1.7 meters, so we are on the short side. But, so this is to give you a sense of the dimension, a sense of the scale. So this is where we are, humans. We know that we are composed by cells, and this is a cell is about a million times smaller. And then we have DNA within the cells, and this is still another factor 1,000 smaller, and uh, a factor 10 smaller, we have atoms. So we are uh, 10 uh, billion uh, smaller than, than our body when we arrive to the atoms. But what we have discovered along this century is that uh, we the, the atoms have the nuclei. The nuclei is uh, 100,000 smaller than the atom itself. So it's a very tiny point with in the center of the, of the atom. And then we have uh, protons uh, and, and the quarks that are inside the, the, the protons. We don't know if they are composite or not. We suppose today that they are elementary uh, and Experimentally, we, what we know is that their dimension is smaller than 10 to the minus 18 meter. So quite, quite small indeed. So um, what we know about forces, what we know about forces is, uh, is very much the result of a history of unification of phenomena. Um, different phenomena uh, were found explana common explanations in, in common forces. So Newton understood that the fact that uh, apples fall to us and that uh, the Earth's uh, orbits around the Sun is as a, the same origin. This, this is the, the gravity. Um, in the 19th century, uh, electrical phenomena in magne magnetism and optics that apparently are totally different things uh, were found an expl a common explanation in the theory of electromagnetism. And uh, uh, radioactive decays, this is uh, already in the, in, this, uh, in the 20th century, have a common explanation with the behavior of the sun, why the, the sun shines. And this is due to the weak force. And uh, I will, uh, along these lectures, tell you that electromagnetism and weak force 
are very much connected in something that we now call the electroweak interaction. And uh, finally, uh, we know today that the atomic nucleus and the nuclear energy, everything that is uh, around the nucleus, is, has to do with another interaction that we call the strong force. So, so this is that, uh, these are the fundamental forces uh, in, in nature. So in the 19th century, you knew about the gravity, they knew about electric force, uh, force field, so sparks, electricity, about magnetism, uh, so you see here the iron fillings around a, a bar magnet where you see the lines of force of the, the magnetic forces and it was really an achievement of the physics of this century to understand that all these things, e electricity and magnetism is, a, is the same thing, has the same explanation, is the electromagnetic is due to the electromagnetic force field. So radio waves, microwaves, light, all this is uh, electromagnetic field. Uh, this field is described by these four equations here. These are the Maxwell equations. It's remarkable that with this tool that is mathematics, we can understand how this electromagnetic field works and then to make work antennas and the emission telecommunications, all of that. This is based on this, on this equation. So there is a, here another idea, another concept is that we need the, this quantification that is, uh, that is uh, given by, by mathematics. So the electron was the first uh, uh, particle discovered. Uh, historically is, uh, is seen like that. This was done in uh, 1897 by Thomson. Uh, he was uh, making experiments with uh, something that is called a cathode ray tube. So it's uh, a glass uh, uh, tube with this uh, funny shape where he made vacuum inside and on the left there you see there are two electrodes here the plus and the minus and you apply a voltage there, a strong voltage, and when it, uh, with this voltage, it uh, liberates some electrons from the cathode. So this is what happens, and these electrons are then accelerated, and uh, uh, and because you have here the, this this voltage that accelerates the electrons, the electrons go through the tube, and at the end of the tube there was a fluorescent uh, material that created light. So if it was dark in the room, he could see spots due to this beam of electrons. And this is essentially how the cathode uh, tube of uh, a normal TV set worked in the 10 years ago. So he made a number of experiments deflecting this beam, both with electrical fields given by the ear tube, represented here by two plates, and also by coils at outside of the, of, of the tube, creating magnetic fields and seeing how the, 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 the beam was deflected by, by the magnetic fields. So there was a beam, there was some signal in the, in the fluorescent screen at the end of the tube, but what, what was it? Was it a wave? Uh, was it a, a stream of particles? And what Thomson made, so he made a number of measurements, he measured the total electrical charge that is accumulated. That is, I will go through these equations very quickly, but this is the number of electrons times the charge of each one, if, if the hypothesis of the electron is true. Then he measured the heat that is produced in the tube, in the impact region. And this, you know that the energy of each electron is the kinetical energy, you remember eventually from high school, one half mass times uh, the square of velocity times the number of electrons. And then he measured also the deflection in the magnetic field, the magnetic field, uh, and this was known from electromagnetism. How much a beam is deflected, uh, a given charge is deflected in a, in a magnetic field. And with these equations, he, he said, if this electron exists, then the ratio between this charge and this mass is given by this equation that you can derive from the others and as a, as a, as a given value. So does this demonstrate that the electron exists? No, by itself it's not enough. What, what matters is that then there were a number of other experiments that confirmed this thing, making different measurements in different conditions, changing this and changing that. Then we took this value E over N electron and we tried to explain phenomena in the atom. And we could understand some 
something that was called for the, the Zeeman effect was, and it fitted with the value that was determined this way. So there were a number of indications that uh, uh, the electron di really exists, and it, it is always like that. We don't have a single experiment that finds something. There is always an accumulation of evidence by a number of people. We, we like very much to remember Thomson, but Thomson was just one among many that participated in, in all of this. So this is to the other aspect of this. I'm insisting on that because people, well, how do I see a party? Did, I, did Thomson saw the electron? No, he, he didn't s saw any electron. He made e the measurements and indirectly, is the explanation that this beam is composed of electrons made sense. And that's why people start believing about the electrons. Okay, working with uh, these tubes led to another discovery, and this by chance was Röntgen, that at some point discovered that close to these tubes there were a radiation that was produced, that was a radiation, a penetrating radiation, that now we know it, this, this, uh, that are X-rays. So this, uh, indeed, what happens is that these electrons are stopped at the end of the tube, and when the electrons are stopped, they emit a, an X-ray. So it's uh, a non, non, we know this uh, now quite well. But it was very strange, because uh, this radiation was fixed in photographic plates, and nobody knew exactly what, what, what it was. But uh, progressively grew the idea that X-rays are also electromagnetic radiation of very small wavelengths. So later on, someone measured the speed of this radiation and uh, found out that it is e equal to the speed of light. So another argument to say that these are electromagnetic waves. So another discovery in that period was the discover of radioactivity done by Becquerel. This was another thing ver very funny, because Becquerel was uh, uh, working with fluorescent uh, material. So you expose a given piece of material that is fluorescent to light, and then you put this, this material in the dark, and itself it emits this fluorescent light. So everybody knows uh, this uh, fluorescent phenomena. When he, and, uh, the information came about X-rays, um, he, he, he was working with uh, uranium salt, that is itself a fluorescent uh, substance, and he wanted to know if fluorescence could be induced by X-rays, and not by light, by, not by sunlight, but by X-rays. So he ordered the, the uranium salt, and he put it, when it arrived, he put it in a drawer. But he put it in a drawer on top of um, a film, a uh, photographic film. The photographic film was uh, uh, wrapped around black paper, so uh, it should not be sensitive to, to light. But what he discovered when he looked uh, to this film, he, he, he saw these, uh, these spots here that corresponded exactly to the piece of uranium that he put on top of the, of the, of the film. So there was something traversing the black paper and giving uh, this image on the photographic film. And this something were indeed electrons that were emitted by this uranium salt. So the uranium salt were, was emitting electrons because of this radioactivity. At that time, these were not immediately associated to electrons. They were called beta rays. So Marie Curie made a, an enormous work with radioactive elements. Uh, she found, uh, uh, she isolated uh, uranium. So we understand that the element uranium was the responsible for the radioactivity. Then he is, she isolated polonium and uh, radio together with uh, her husband, uh, Pierre Curie. So uh, there were, at that time, three types of radiations, alpha, beta, and gamma rays. And this where uh, uh, established this the difference was established by a number of people, in particular by Rutherford. And uh, what uh, uh, we, we understood is that uh, he understood is that beta rays are electrons, alpha rays that are also emitted in by radiation are ionized atoms of helium, so essentially are uh, two protons and two neutrons together, 
and the Polvila later on discovered that also gamma rays emitted uh, from some substances and uh, these were associated to electromagnetic fields. Um, so the Rutherford was uh, made a number of very uh, big contributions to science. So uh, I mentioned uh, the identification of the, the beta and alpha rays. He also was the first one to understand the transmutation, observe the transmutation of elements. Uh, in particular, he observed uranium decaying to thorium. So this is very was very strange at that time. Remember the alchemists. So they were trying to change substance in gold. And now we, uh, there is a scientist, official established scientist, saying that elements are changing from one type to another. It, it took some courage to, <laughs> to Rutherford to present this result. Um, so uh <coughs> the third contribution from Rutherford was a fundamental uh, thing that influenced physics uh, since ever. Um, and the experiment was aimed to understand what is the atom, how the atom is constituted, how it is formed. So at that time, in the, in, uh, uh, in the beginning of the 20th century, the common thinking was that the, the, the atom was like a plum pudding uh, with positive and negative charges uniformly distributed in the volume of the atom. And so what he made is, uh, is the following. So he took a, a radioactive substance emitting alpha particles, each one has 5 MeV, that's a unit of energy. Uh, the substance was polonium, and he sent these particles, this radiation, over a thin foil of, go of uh, gold. A foil of gold, sorry. And uh, he observed how this radiation was deflected by the foil. And uh, what he observed is, in some cases, the alpha particles were deflected at large angles, and in some cases they even uh, were reflected back. And uh, the calculations with this plum punning model could not explain these results. That means that you have an alpha particle that is charged two, they are two protons. So to, make a def to deflect this, you have to have an electrical field. So you have to have an, an another charge that uh, deflects this, uh, this alpha particle. And you can compute what is the force, the, need, the, the force that is needed to deflect a particle with 5 MeV by a given angle. And if all the charge of the atom is distributed in a large volume, you don't have enough concentration of charge to provoke this, uh, this deflection. There was not enough force. So what he, he, con he concluded is that the charge, the positive charge of the nucleus has to be concentrated in a single point so that you have lot, uh, a large concentration of charge in a given point when the alpha particle comes very close to this point, then it is deflected because it approaches very much and the force, the repulsion, repulsion is, uh, is large, is big. So this, is our, this was the first uh, particle physics experiment, if you want. It was a, you have a beam, that is the alpha particle. It is sent to a target, that is the, the, goal, the, the foil of gold. And you have a detector that detects how the alpha, uh, the alpha particles are are deflected. And then you have a model, a theory, that explains your experimental results. So a new model of the atom was built. Protons are concentrated on the nucleus. The electrons are dispersed on the volume of the atom orbiting ar around the nucleus. So um, at that point, we understood that matter is essentially vacuum because uh, if you put it to scale, if you, if you put, you say, protons and neutrons in the atom are, say, a centimeter in size, and then you put the, the, the electrons at, uh, at, at the same scale, the electrons are tiny, so at the diameter of a single air, but the entire atom, the diameter of the atom is greater than the length of 30 football fields. So essentially, 99.99999% of the atom volume is just empty space. All the matter is concentrated in a tiny spot in the nucleus. Now I mentioned already the photoelectric uh, effect. What, what was that? So people have, have observed that when you send light on a piece of matter, electrons are emitted. And in particular with metals, this is very easily observed. 
So think about this experiment. So you have light, you li light is a wave, and you send this light over a piece of metal. It's there. Now you, you want to increase the energy of the light. So you, you increase the amplitude, the amplitude of the wave. So this is classically what uh, increasing the energy of, of the, the wave is to increase its amplitude. If you have a small wave in water, the energy is small. If the wave is, is large, the energy is big. So now what happens is that you do this, and but there are no electrons emitted. So you continue to increase the amplitude of the wave and no electron emitted. Strange, because if you, have, you put more energy, you should liberate electrons that are attached to the, to the atoms. So what was then the, the observation? The observation is that some, someone decided to change the frequency of, of the light. And at some point, when the frequency increased above a given lev level, electrons started to be emitted. And if the frequency is not so big, the, the electrons are emitted with low energy. If the frequency is, uh, is very large, then electrons are emitted with higher energy. So this was strange. Why the frequency has to do with these electrons? And this is where Einstein has this insight. So he, he said, um, he proposed that the electromagnetic field is indeed formed of quanta, he called it quanta, each with an energy that is proportional to the frequency of the electromagnetic wave. So the electromagnetic wave is a continuum. So we see waves as a continuum, as in the sea or whatever. But what is said is that the wave, this continuum is just a macroscopic impression of what we have of, of the wave. The wave is indeed formed by small spots that are these quantum that are now called photons. Now if the photon has enough energy, a single one can liberate an electron. The photon interacts with the electron, atomic electron. It, if it has enough energy, it, the, the, the electron is, is, is liberated. So it's enough that the, the, then the electron has an, an energy that, he has said that, it, that exceeds the binding energy W of the electron to the atom. And if you say, well, the photon energy is proportional to the, um, to the frequency, the frequency is given here by this character that is new there. So this is the letter, Greek letter that is used to give, to, to represent frequency. H is a constant, is the Planck constant. So H times frequency is the energy of the photon. So if this H times frequency is above the binding energy, then the electron is liberated. So this was the first um, uh, the, the a very important experiment, experimental result that led to directly to the idea of, of quantum. And it was because of that that Einstein got the Nobel Prize, not because of relativity. It was because of this. In, uh, so he got the prize in, in uh, 1921 for a work that he did in, uh, in 1905. So um, now we know that we have this, all this electromagnetic spectrum. We have waves of long uh, wavelengths that corresponds to photons of small energy. At some point we have uh, radio, so microwaves, then we have visible light that is there at some uh, wavelengths, and then uh, the frequency increases. We have X-rays, and then we have gamma rays. All these are photons. Now, so imagine uh, your digital camera, 10 megapixel and very small pixels, each pixel 10 microns, so to have photo, photos with, uh, with good resolution. Now, I'm going to create a photo with individual photons. So, suppose that I have 3,000 photons, so I don't see very much. So this is what happens when I, I see in my camera my photo, but just using 3,000 photons. Now I increase the number of photons, and I have 10,000 photons, and I start to see something. It looks like a face. And now uh, if I go to up to 1 million photons, then I see the, the, the full picture, and, uh, and with 30 million, I see it. So this is how really the image is created in your camera, is, is created by all these uh, uh, photons uh, in... Uh, in, in the pixels of your uh, CCD. So, 
Electromagnetic waves are particles. So then what about parti particles of matter, electron? Are they waves as well? Yes, this is, was uh, the insight of uh, Louis de Broglie in 1923. He proposed that particles of matter as the electron have a dual nature. They are both particles and waves. In some cases they behave like particles, in other cases they behave like waves. And this is a fundamental thing of quantum physics. Nobody understands it, but it's like that. So, <laughs> so there are two equations that relate particle characteristics with wave characteristics. So energy relates to frequency, as I already said. Momentum, momentum is just the mass times the velocity of the particle, relates to the wavelength of the, of the wave. So these expressions are the main bridge between the two represent representations of reality. Now this uh, cathode tube that I mentioned about that Thomson was working, uh, uh, that Thomson used to discover the, the electron, people, physicists were working with this tube since uh, decades, uh, but not with vacuum inside the tube, with gases inside the tube. And they were provoking, applying voltages to this gas, creating sparks, if you want, electricity along the traversing the gas, and what happens to the gas? The gas emits light. This is how some of these things work. So you have a voltage, there are gas in the tube, and that's why it, then it, uh, it emits light. And they can measure, people were measuring this light, and measuring what? Measuring the wavelengths of this, of this light. What is the spectrum of this light? And what they observed are things like this picture. This is one of the first, this is the spectrum of the hydrogen atom. What it shows is that the light emitted by hydrogen is concentrated in a given range of frequencies, in given values of frequencies. So this is the value of frequency, this is another different frequency, this is higher frequency, etc. So it's not a continuum of uh, frequencies, it's just pe peculiar values. Why these values? Why this is discrete? Why nature is not continuous? Why it's discrete? So this was really the, the basis of, uh, of quantum. And quantum physics was in very much developed to understand this spectrum, to, to give an explanation to, to this. Sommerfeld said in 1919, since the discover of spectral analysis, nobody could doubt that the language of the atom would be understood if one could interpret the atomic spectra. Now the object, so the problem is that um, nobody could understand the atom, why atoms are emitting light, already because atoms cannot be explained by classical physics. In classical physics, atoms are impossible. They don't exist. Why? Because you have a positive charge and you have an electron around. And people knew that if this electron is turning around, he emits radiation. This was new, known from the Maxwell equations. If he emits radiation, he loses energy. If he loses energy, then he, psh, he goes to the, to the, to the center. He's attracted to the nucleus. So atoms in classical phys physics were expected to live less than a microsecond. You make the calculations, so there are no atoms. This was really uh, a big puzzle. And this is where Niels Bohr introduces quantum atom. So it just introduced postulate things. He said, well, we don't have classic physics doesn't work, so I just decreed by law <laughs> that the atomic electrons can only exist in certain orbits, known as quantum states. Each quantum state corresponds to a certain energy of the electron, and these energies can on only take certain discrete values. And when the, the electron is in an excited state and the atom decays to the ground state, it emits a photon, light, with an energy that is the difference between the energy of these two states. So these are the principles of the uh, atom of Niels Bohr. So there is, you, you don't understand why it is, but it, nature it is like this. So it just said what nature was telling him. So, and uh, with this, then he tries to work out ways to compute 
these frequencies of the hydrogen atom, and he, he was uh, he didn't, didn't succeed completely, but he, he was close. Quantum physics is uh, is weird. Uh, really, uh, we don't understand. It's one of the things that maybe in the next uh, millennium, human, <laughs> humankind will eventually understand. But so suppose this experiment: you have uh, you have here a gun uh, shooting uh, bullets, and you have a screen with two slits. And then the, you have uh, a, a detector here, so a, a another screen that is, a, that is a detector. So you can detect where the bullets arrive. And so, and this is the same experiment, but now with waves. So um, you send a wave, the wave is diffracted in these two slits, so we have two waves, and these two waves interfere. And uh, so there are ups and downs on the waves. They interfere, and they, on the detector, they give this wavy pattern. So these uh, uh, these ups and downs that are represented here by this graph. So the bullet model gives a distribution that is continuous like that. There is no ups and downs. And here you have the what we call interference pattern. Now we do this experiment with electrons. So you close one slit. We have just one open and the electrons behave like bullets. Now you leave the two slits open and what you observe, you observe this wavy pattern. So the electrons behave as a wave. Now you um, sorry. Now you shoot um, electrons one by one. Because you may say, well, if the, if the two slits are open, the electron maybe is a wave, half of it goes through one slit, the other half goes through the other, they interfere somehow. Now you send one by one. You send one, you wait it to arrive to the detector and see a spot. So in the top figure, you see spots of the electrons in the detector. So there, there are just a few. And then you continue your experiment. And what you observed after a while is that the electrons create, after you have uh, billions of electrons in your detector, they create this wavy pattern. Regions of the detector where the electrons can arrive, the bright regions, and the dark regions where the electron doesn't arrive. So the electrons are behaving as a, as a, as a wave, but they, at the same time they are behaving as, a, as, a, as particles. And so this is one of the mysteries that is still with us today. So I will not uh, go through this slide because it's a bit technical. There are quantum probabilities. There, are, there is a quantum a quant a thing that is uh, uh, the wave function that describes the system, the quantum systems, but uh, I do not have time to, to go through this. Just to tell you that one important uh, development was done by Schrodinger that could wrote an equation that was the first quantum equation that allowed to describe uh, uh, quantum systems and uh, he applied his equation to the simplest system that he could imagine that is the hydrogen atom. Hydrogen atom is a proton in the nucleus electro an electron around. All the other atoms are more complicated. So this one was the simp simplest one but the, the important thing was to be able to predict the light, remember the spectrum, the light that the hydrogen atom uh, was emitting. And what he succeeded with his equation is really to compute and uh, to predict these frequencies. So this is how physics works. You have to have an experiment, an observation, and then you have to have some mathematics, some model that mathematically describes that, uh, that reality and gives quantitative predictions. So I will talk, mention the spin of the particle. So mo pr most probably you know uh, already about the spin, but because this, uh, this is important for uh, understanding uh, fermions and bosons and then the Higgs boson, let me tell you a little bit about the spin. So the particles have a property. They have, they have several properties that are called quantum numbers, but one of the property is called is this spin. And this is a kind of increasing angular momentum. So it's like... Uh, it's a particle is spinning over itself, like a planet that, uh, that is spinning. The problem is that the particle is, if it is a point, uh, it doesn't make much sense, a point rotating over it, uh, itself. So classically, the spin does, does, does not make too much sense. Uh, quant in quantum physics, uh, it makes. And this spin, like other 
quantum quantities is discrete, so it can only have certain values in a given, in given units. They can be integer, the spin particles can have spin 0, 1 or 2, or 3, 4, etc. Or they can be half integer, they can have values half integer, 1 half, uh, 3 halves, uh, etc. The other thing is that this spin is quantified in space. So imagine something spinning and the, s the spin defines a vector, a direction, so like the... And now classically this vector can be point to any place in, the, in the any direction in the space. Uh, in quantum physics it's not like that. This spin is... Quanti the direction of the spin is quantified. If a particle of spin one half can only point in two directions, can I have spin with a plus one half or minus one half? So it's really it's really strange, but it's but it fits the measurements. That's the important thing. Now they, there is a, a gentleman from India, uh, a physicist called Bowles, that introduced. Uh, uh, some of these aspects, that means the, the, the fact that uh, particles uh, have different properties uh, if they have an integer spin or an integer, uh, half integer spin. There is a deep quantum mechanical effect that makes that these two types of particles very different. So bosons tend to clump together in the lowest energy quantum state. Two, on the other hand, two or more identical fermions cannot occupy the same quantum state. This is the, the so-called uh, exclusion principle of Pauli. So here you see, uh, you have here the fermion motel. You have uh, people arriving to the fermion motel and each one wants its own room. And uh, this is, uh, they behave like fermions. And here in the boson in people do not mind to stay in the same room. So these are bosons. They can clump together in the, same, in the same state. This has very important consequences. In particular, it justifies why uh, matter is, uh, and chemical elements and the atoms are what they are. So uh, electrons are fermions and they occupy different orbits in the atom because of this, of this uh, exclusion principle. They cannot all electrons in the, in the atom gold, for example, be in the fundamental uh, orbits or in the same orbit. They have to, to have different, different orbits. And this is what makes gold different from uh, the iron and, and so on. So this was a quite uh, fast introduction to quantum physics and uh, the, the, this uh, first period of the 20th century. And the important point to retain from me is that the quantum principles, they underlie the theories of atoms, nuclei, and elementary particles developed in the 20th century. It's a kind of common background that is everywhere. We don't mention it too much. We don't continue to refer to quantum physics. It's, it's, it's there. So everything is built upon this thing. Now, now I arrive somehow uh, to the 30s uh, and, uh, and, and I will talk about some of the discoveries that uh, made the next jump in, uh, in our understanding of, uh, of matter and, and particle physics. So, and one of these results, uh, some of these results came from cosmic rays. So we know that uh, occasionally energetical particles enter our atmosphere uh, from outer space and they interact with uh, atoms of the atmosphere and they create a cascade of other particles. And uh, these uh, cascades of particles were a source of many important discoveries in, the, in particular in this period of the 30s and 40s. Um, to give you a, an idea of the energies, we are the important thing is what are the energies of these particles. Particles from radioactive decays have typically an energy of one mega electron volt, so one million electron volt, so we say one MeV. And energies of cosmic rays are mostly measured in giga electron volt, and the giga electron volt is 10 to the 9th electron volt, and we, s we say GeV. Now another important point that, uh, uh, that I will not uh, lose too much time here, but it's important to mention is that a number of techniques appeared 
that allowed discoveries. This is very important. Discoveries don't happen because people have ideas about theories or about experiments uh, to do. Discoveries also happen because some technologies make possible experiments. And uh, in particular, how do you see these cosmic particles? Uh, we are traversed now by cosmic particles at this very moment. Do you see any? No, we don't. So we need to have some instrument to see the particles. And this, one of the first was this cloud chamber. So you have a chamber with, uh, with a kind of cloud. And uh, when the particle traverses this cloud, there are droplets of water that are formed along the, if, if this is uh, 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 vapor, water vapor. And uh, along the trajectory, you see all these droplets. You take a photo, and you see the, you see the particle. So this, there were other detectors uh, this invented in that time, the geiger muller counter. Uh, and there was a, a, a thing that is called the coincident circuit that was the, this the ancestor of the modern logic circuits that are today used in computers. Now, in 32, Carl Anderson made uh, an, a, a very important observation. He discovered in these cloud chambers a particle that, you see, it's bent. Why it's bent? It's bent because there is around the chamber a magnetic field. So you could put a big magnetic field. And so the particle has a charge. In because it has a charge, it is deflected. And knowing the sense of the currents in the magnet, he could understand that this particle is positive, is deflected in the positive side, but cannot be a proton. For reasons that are now too long to explain, the size of the drop of these uh, uh, droplets of water depends on the velocity of the particle. And if it was a proton, the particle would be slower, and if it was slower, these droplets would be too, should be bigger, and they, they, they were tiny. So the particle could not be a proton. Remember, at that time, there were protons and electrons. Protons with positive charge, electrons with negative charge. So, and this seemed to be an electron, but with positive charge. So this was the first particle of antimatter discovered, is the positron. Uh, now, indeed, this, uh, there was a, a physicist that is Paul Dirac that in 28, um, uh, 28 uh, suggested the existence of antimatter based on equations. And he used to say that the equation was smarter than himself because indeed this equation, when he tried to combine the Einstein relativity with quantum physics, he discovered that uh, there is here a plus and a minus sign in this uh, result. The energy can be positive or negative according to this equation. So you have E squared equal to something. So you take the square root. You can have a positive solution or a negative solution. What's a negative energy? energy is positive, it's not negative. So he said, well, it's not, the energy is not negative. It's the antiparticle with positive energy. So it was quite smart. So, uh, and indeed, then it was discovered. So another discovery was uh, uh, in 35, something that we call now the pion, the pion meson. Me it's a meson. Meson is a kind of particle, and this one is pion. It's de described by this, uh, the pi, uh, Greek letter. So, and this is uh, a particle that was somehow predicted by Yukawa in 35, because, well, remember, we now we have the nuclei in the atom, protons together. Protons have electrical charge, positive, so they repel, they have a re uh, repel each other. Uh, so that we have to have some force that binds them together, so it's evident. But what is this force? Uh, we can give it a name. It's a strong force. But now, what is the equation What is the, the s that describes this force? And Yukawa was one of the first to try something. And he proposed, well, this force is due to, e to the exchange of pions. Uh, we'll come back to this idea of exchanging particles to explain interactions. And indeed, uh, it's not the case. Uh, the, the pion doesn't uh, describe the, s the strong force. But indeed, uh, it's, the, it's related to the strong force, but in an indirect way. But uh, Powell, in 47, discovered these pions. This is a particle that has a mass in between the electron and in between <coughs> the proton. That's why the word meson, meson uh, from the Greek medium. 
few years later, another particle discovered in these cosmic rays and in these cloud chambers, as a meson called Kaon, that people called Kaon. And it was strange, strange in the sense that it was al always produced in pairs. Why it's produced always in pairs? So this was the start of this inflation of discovery of new particles that I mentioned before. So, um, and again, the technology comes uh, in, into play. So at that point in time, particle accel accelerators made their entry in particle physics. We, people were doing experiments with cosmic rays, but cosmic rays, they come when they want, they have the energy that they want, and things, so people could not control the experiment. They could not control the beam, they could not control the interactions. With particle accelerators, what you do is that you take a stable particle, an electron or a proton, you accelerate it to a given energy, to the largest possible kinetic energy, and you smash it into matter, and you see what happens. So, but you control everything. You know what is the energy, you know the type of particle, you know uh, that this thing will happen at that point in time, so you can measure and so on. And it was the, the, these particle accelerators that allowed uh, the creation in laboratory of a number of new particles, heavy particles that do not exist normally in nature, they are unstable, and this was allowed by this famous equation of Einstein, energy equal mass. So what was happening is that in these collisions, it's not like a collision of two cars where you have pieces going as apart, what you have is that the kinetic energy is transformed into matter and you have the creation in the collisions of new particles. And uh, so now this happens every, in every detector uh, in, and uh, in every accelerator and uh, as I said this accelerator technology allowed the discovery of an entire particle zoo essentially in the 50s and the 60s. So the Cosmotron in Brookhaven was uh, one of the first pro proton synchrotrons at 2.3 GV, so giga electron volt. So we had quite above the, the, the energies of uh, radioactive decays. And uh, this then uh, was replaced by the AGS in the, in the 60s. So and then uh, the uh, accelerator started essentially in the US after the war and uh, benefiting very much from the all the efforts on during the, the war to to build the, the atomic bomb, and uh, and then Europe later catch up uh, uh, in building uh, their own accelerators. So uh, the cloud chamber was replaced by another detector. It's called the bubble chamber. So here uh, it's uh, but it's a similar type. This is the, the kind of photos that uh, uh, many of people m many people know. Uh, where a number of these uh, particles were observed. This is uh, an example of one particle that is the omega minus, uh, uh, the discovery of the omega minus. Uh, and, and so there were dozens of these, of these particles at some point. So and then people uh, started to build tables like Mendeleev. So uh, now this, uh, the tables have a different form, but the idea is the same. So we have to, have to find regularities in these particles according to the charge, the mass, uh, the spin, uh, etc. So you classify things, uh, and um, the table, the tables had gaps, like in Mendeleev. Uh, so the, the old periodic table story repeats now one level down. And uh, the one of the lessons from Mendeleev is that uh, uh, objects uh, indeed were divisible into smaller objects. So maybe, or uh, most probably, these hadrons, so they were called hadrons, all these particles, they are divisible in something smaller. And this was indeed proposed in 64 by Gelman and Zweig, and it was the, the quark model. So they proposed the model with three objects, three quarks, up, down, and strange. And with these three objects, they could build all these tables. They could uh, justify all of these tables. So there are two types of hadrons, mesons, that are compared one down, down quark, as it is written here. And the neutron is one up quark and two down quarks. And uh, the charges, the electrical charges of these quarks are plus two thirds or minus one third. And if you compute this, uh, you see that it gives, uh, you sum all the charges together, it gives charge one for the proton and charge zero for the neutron.
So very well. So uh, we understood the hadrons. We simplified our, our table. So now let me uh, go back in time to the 30s and to the other part of the story, to the neutrinos. To the neutrinos and to the bursts of weak interaction. The interaction that is responsible for the radioactive decays. So the, neutrino, the story of the neutrinos comes with uh, exactly this beta decay. So in the beta decay, what happens is we have a nuclei, it transforms, it, is, it changes into another nuclei and emits an electron. Now, this is what we call a two-body decay. Some, some object that decays in two, so they, they go in opposite direction. And in a two-body decay, the energy of the two bodies is fixed, is determined, is given by a by equation that only depends on the masses of the object A, of the object B, and the mass of the electron. is fixed. So the energy of this electron should be fixed. So now, we, one of the better decays is the decay of tritium to helium. And uh, according to this equation, the electron that is emitted in this decay should have 17 kV. But no, the electron, as when we measure, it has an energy between 0 and 17. So that's a big problem. So many people proposed, well, energy is not conserved. This was a radical proposal. It was not accepted. And uh, Paul he came, came with a better explanation. He said, well, there is a third particle that is emitted in this interaction, and, but this particle is not detected by our detectors. So it is emitted. We don't see it. It carries part of the energy. So if it carries part of the energy, the electron doesn't get all the energy, and so the electron energy can be between 0 and 17. KV. So this new particle was called the neutrino. So this is how the neutrino was, was introduced. Now later, uh, so this was a really fantastic period uh, in this uh, beginning of the 30s. Fermi came with uh, another explanation for this decay saying that what happens in the nucleus is that indeed uh, is a proton that uh, is transformed into a neutron and uh, emitting in this process uh, or a neutron that uh, emitting a positron or a neutron that go goes to, uh, transforms into a proton emitting, emitting in this process an electron and a neutrino. And uh, he saw in this decay, Fermi saw in this decay um, a new force being involved. Uh, and the uh, people call this, uh, this, this new force the weak force. And why weak force? Because there is a property of the decays that is the lifetime. So a particle, particles are unstable. They decay to other particles. Or nuclei are unstable. They decay to, to, other, part, to other nuclei. The time it takes uh, varies, changes. Some nuclei re remain in the excited state during a long time, and then they decay. Others, they decay very quickly. And this time has to do with the strengths of the interaction that is in play. If the interaction is strong, they decay very quickly. Essentially, they, they are break apart very quickly and they decay very quickly. If the, the li lifetime is long, this, this means that the interaction is weak. And that's why this new force was called the weak interaction. So, um, experiments in the cosmic rays were con being conducted. Remember, we are still in the 30s, we went back in the time, and Anderson observed a particle, a new particle at that time was called the muon. So we are in the period where we, we knew about neutron, proton, and electrons. So we, the pions and so on, the ions were not yet discovered. We are in the 30s. So we have an atom, a model of the atom that is perfect. We, we understand all the elements. And now it comes the muon. And this muon is a particle that traverses uh, Large, amounts, large thickness of matter without interacting. So here it goes the muon, and then it decays to an, to an electron. And uh, nobody could understand what was the role of this muon. What is the place of the muon in the structure of matter? It doesn't belong to the atom. So what? So the rabbi uh, is quoted to have said, who ordered that? Indeed, what is, and this is, uh, in a sense, is the, is the start of particle physics as we see it now, with new objects that are not directly related to matter as we have on Earth. So, are particles that are produced in collisions, in 
this muon is produced in the collisions of cosmic rays with the atmosphere or that are produced in accelerators, they are unstable and they then decay to the particles of matter as we see on Earth. So, talking about tables, this was the table before the muon discovered, the, the, the muon discovery, so I have the proton, the neutron, the neutrino and the electron, so this is nice, the proton, neutron and electron forms the atom, the, the neutrino is involved in the beta decays, but now I have here the muon, and the muon looks alike, like an electron, a heavier electron, an electron with higher mass, so that's why we put here the muon aside the electron. But then the table looks uh, strange. And uh, indeed, when, now I come back to, si to I go move forward to the 60s with uh, after the quark model have been proposed by Gelman in 64. So what, what we have as a table, we have replaced the proton and the neutron by these quarks at up and down, that they make protons and neutrons. And I have a third quark that is a strange, Remember these strange particles that are produced in pairs? Why? Because the strange, when it is produced, you have to produce a strange quark and an anti-strange quark. And this gives the pair. And then, well, if I have the mu and maybe there are two types of neutrinos. So you have here a neutrino of the electron and a neutrino of the mu, and, and indeed uh, it is the case. But looking to this table, it looks that it, there is one piece missing. And uh, in 74, there was a double discovery and this uh, was called the November Revolution. It was amazing because this particle is the only one in particle physics that has a double name. This is a J and a Psi. It's called a J Psi because it was discovered at the same time two independent groups using two different methods. So it was uh, discovered at Brookhaven uh, in proton collisions and it was discovered at SLAC in uh, electron-positron collisions and both came up to uh, discover of a particle that is composed of a new quark, that is the charm, and is composed of a charm, an anti-charm quark, and makes this J psi. So this is a picture of the sphere E plus E minus collider at, uh, at SLAC. You see that the detectors are now much more complicated than the cloud chambers, so we have moved from uh, uh, cloud chambers and uh, 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 to electronic detectors based on electronics. But what is important here is to notice that now the table has become became like this. So it's it's a nice uh, and uh, nice table with two columns. Uh, so everybody was uh, really happy with this. It was a, a, an achievement we called the November Revolution. Uh, it took two years this model because in '77 a new <laughs> lepton was discovered. So again, a whole missing column, and indeed it is. So uh, the story continued, Man, a number of other, so the tau lepton was discovered in 77, uh, then there were two new quarks discovered, the bottom quark and the top quark. Uh, in 77, the top quark took longer to discover, it took up to 95, it was discovered in Fermilab near Chicago and uh, with an enormous mass, so the, that's why it took so long. So you see the mass of the top is 173 GeV. The mass of the proton is 1 GeV. So this, is, this particle, this quark, is 170 times heavier than, than the proton. So it, it doesn't exist in stable form. It decays immediately when it is formed, but it, is, uh, but it exists. In quantum field theory, that's uh, the name of, of the thing, the electromagnetic interaction between two charged particles is due to the exchange of uh, virtual photons between these particles. So this is the, the concept. Uh, you can have an idea how it works, singing about these two people on two boats and sending balls. The ball is the equivalent of the photon that is exchanged. And uh, when they send the ball, the, the boat goes a bit uh, on, on to the back, and so they go apart, and this represents, uh, uh, gives the effect of an interaction, of a repulsion between the two charges, eventually, of these two bolts. So I the same model is, uh, is more, it's not, it's more complicated to explain with this model, the, the, the an attraction, uh, but it's just to give you a feeling, an idea, uh, what, what we are talking about. So, in quantum field theory, interactions 
are mediated by other particles. Two particles interact because they exchange something that we call also a boson, we call a gauge boson, and there are gauge bosons for each one of the interaction types. So this theory do doesn't invalidate the classical theory, but uh, it restricts its scope. When the number of photons exchange is very large, the classical field description is valid. So we have all these, in these four interactions. Um, we have the strong interaction that bounds together the quarks. The mediator is called uh, here on the left. Sorry. Where is the pointer? Is called the gluon. In fact, there are eight types of gluons. Don't b bother too much about the details. If there are eight, the names and so on, it's not so important. Uh, the electromagnetic interaction is mediated by the photon. Then there is the weak interaction that we call the, the charge current interaction mediated by W's, these W bosons. There are two, W plus and W minus. And finally, the weak neutral current that is mediated by the Z0. Z uh, so, and this will come, these graphs here will come in, uh, in the next transparency. These are the, the main elements of something that we call the Feynman diagrams. I will explain a little bit what is that. So what you see is that you have a quark and this quark has here a vertex, it emits a gluon. So a quark emits a gluon. Here I have a muon, it's a charged particle, and emits a photon. And here I have a d quark, emits a w, and in this process it changes to u quark. So it's the only interaction that makes the nature of the, the f what we call the flavor of the particle to change. A d quark changes to a u quark. And here you have something that is very much like uh, uh, this electromagnetic interaction. You have a quark, it radiates a z0, zero because it has no charge, and it remains the same quark. So these are the basic types of, uh, of interactions. You see that these alphas here give the, the strengths of the interaction, the, and normalizing to the strong interaction, giving arbitrary number one, value one for the strong, the electromagnetic is 107 ti se se 137 times smaller, and uh, the, <coughs> the weak interaction is uh, uh, 40 times smaller. Don't take this, these numbers too serious, because these constants depend uh, on, uh, they, they don't reflect directly the strengths of interaction, as I, I will uh, uh, tell in a moment very precisely. So, what are these Feynman diagrams? So, what the, uh, I mentioned the Dirac equation when uh, it, it described uh, found when Dirac found an equation describing the positron antimatter, and from there there were uh, about 20 years to develop this quantum field theory, and uh, it was really a remarkable development. It was uh, it was made between the 30s and the 50s, and one. Uh, of the main players in this development was uh, a U.S. physicist named Richard Feynman, and he introduced a very clever thing. He, he found out a structure in the equations, so a kind of uh, pattern in the equations, and he could assign a given drawing to each of one of the terms of the equation. So. If the equations were trying to describe the process that is on the left, that is the simplest process. So this process is you have two electrons interacting. So they just deflect. So the, 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 two, pro the two electrons come, they interact, and they, they go away with a deviation of the trajectory. The, the deviation is, is provoked by the interaction. So the equation has a term, there's terms corresponding to the electrons, and there's a term that represents this this particle here, that's a photon, exchanged between the two electrons and that uh, mediates this interaction. So this is what we call a Feynman diagram. Now I have here examples of, of other diagrams. This is, for example, an interaction of a photon, a real photon, with an electron. So the photon can be deflected by the electron and this is the diagram that represents that, or that represents the equation that describes this process. And here is a, a very common process in accelerators, in particular in colliders. Here I have an electron, and here I have a positron, that is the antiparticle. What happens when an, 
a, a particle meets an antiparticle, they annihilate. And the annihilation here goes through a photon, a virtual photon, I will come back to this notion of virtual, photo, virtual particles, that then materializes in a pair of uh, muons, for example. It could be others, but another two particle antiparticle, muon minus, muon plus. So these are particle antiparticle. So the process is positron, electron annihilation, and at the outcome of the interaction is a pair of muons of opposite charge. So quantum field theory that uh, was a mathematical description that, as I told, took uh, about 20 years to develop since the, the initiations of, qu of uh, quantum mechanics, a number of strange phenomena happen, or are the equations tell us that they should happen. One of the things is that a particle-antiparticle pair can pop up from empty, empty space, from vacuum, and then vanish back into, into vacuum again. So these are virtual particles, like, like this. So you saw it? So I can make it again. So you, you appear, appear, and disappear. <laughs> so it's, uh, here what happened is that it, it, there was vacuum and a pair of top, anti-top, that are this very heavy qu quark, 173 GV, appeared, so disappeared, in a time, in a very short amount of time, so it's that it's impossible to really measure detect this top and the top. It's in that sense, that is, it's a virtual particle. But everything uh, in the equations tell us that, yes, this phenomenon exists. And uh, there are other examples of virtual particles. For example, on the right side, take a look at the diagram on the left side, is the same process of, as before. So electron-positron annihilation gives at the end a muon pair, mu plus, mu minus. But here what happened, this, this photon that was here in the middle, at some point they m it materializes again in, a, in this top at the top pair, a fl quantum fluctuation, it goes back again to the photon and it then gives the mu plus mu minus. Now, if we comp compute what, are the probability, what is the probability of this process, that is one of the things that in quantum physics we do a lot, is to compute these probabilities for this phenomena to happen, if we don't take into account this fluctuation, we don't get the good value. But if we take into account the complete theory with these quantum fluctuations, we reproduce the experimental values. So there is some truth to it. So this has far-reaching consequences. The structure of the universe depends on particles that don't exist in the usual sense. So we do not see these particles in everyday life. Top and it's, it's not there, it doesn't make part of this table. And in order to see real manifestations of these objects, we have to, to recreate in the laboratory the state of the early hot universe to be able to make them. Okay, another interaction that uh, I didn't talk too much, but that I would like just to dedicate this slide to it, is the strong interaction, the interaction between quarks uh, and gluons, the mediator of the strong interaction within uh, the, the protons and neutrons and other hadrons. So this interaction has a, has a, speci has a specificity uh, that is the following. Norm in electro let me first uh, say what happens in electromagnetism. You have two charges, and the force between these two charges, for example, a, pro a plus and a minus, that they attract itself, the force goes down if, if the distance increases. In the strong force is the opposite. So if you go pull apart two quarks, the, the intensity, the strength of the interaction increases. It's like a st uh, an elastic uh, string. So if you push the string, the force increases, 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 and then at some point breaks. And what happens when it breaks is that the energy of this string is so large, becomes so large, that it can be materialized in, in matter, in new particles. So and it gives here this, uh, so I've pulled here, so what happens here, I have a collision, electron, positron, two quarks, quark and anti quark are produced in this collision, they fly apart, and then they fly apart, the, the string energy increases, at some point the string energy is materialized in pairs, quark and anti quark, and I have new quarks created. And all these quarks rearrange <coughs> to give hadrons. So I told you yesterday that 
we have hadrons, these mesons and baryons composed by quark and quark or by three quarks. And the truth is that nobody saw yet uh, isolated quark. So quarks only exist inside these baryons. So free quarks do not exist. But this uh, phenomena gives these jets. So when the, these two quarks go aside with large energy, the particles that are these hadrons that are created tend to be produced in jets. And this is uh, exactly what you see in this experiment. So this was exactly this process. So from these two sides, an electron and a positron came. They interact here in the center. They annihilate. And instead of seeing particles going randomly in all directions, isotropically in the space, we see particles collimated along these two directions. And so this is really the manifestation of, uh, of the quarks. <coughs> and it's something that uh, we see a lot in, uh, in our experiments. OK, so, so much for the, for the strong um, interaction. Uh, I just uh, a few words about revisiting the, the, the beta decay and the, the weak interaction. So we remember Fermi described the beta decay is a, nucle a, a nucleus. It emits an electron. So here it is, the electron. And the neutron transforms. So he explained this process by the fact that a neutron transforms itself in a proton, emitting an electron and a neutrino. Now, in the standard model, we now know that this neutron and proton are composed of, of quarks. So we know that the neutron is U, D, D, up, down, down. One of the downs emits a W, the transforms into a U quark. Then I have two U quarks and one D, that makes the proton. And the W decays into an electron and a neutrino. So this is the beta decay. Now, then people realized in the, succeeded to produce in the laboratory beams of neutrinos. I will not describe how, how this is done. I have no time to that. But believe me, they can produce beams of neutrinos. <laughs> and uh, they sent these beams of neutrinos over matter, a, a target. And these neutrinos, that are, by the way, the neutrino of the muon, uh, they can interact either with electrons or with quarks. And here I have a, a Feynman diagram that describes the interaction with the electron. And what happens is that the neutrino transforms itself into a muon, emits a W, and this W is uh, captured, absorbed by the electron, and the electron becomes a neutrino, but a neutrino of the electron. So this is what we call the charge current neutrino interaction. Charged because this object here has a charge. It's a W minus here. So what I have, I have something that is very similar to the interaction between two electrons that I had before with a, f a photon exchanged in between. Now, here it's, it's similar, but it's a bit more complicated. Instead of a photon, it's a W. Instead of having an object of zero charge, I have a, a, a charge. The W has a charge. And the nature of these objects changes. The neutrino becomes a muon the electron becomes a neutrino. So this was observed in the lab. It's not an invention. It's an observation. Now what we have to do is to get a theory that describes this, uh, this observation. Another observation was done at CERN. It was the discovery of neutral currents. So they send the same neutrino beam, neutrino of the muon. And what they saw, that so they, they were expecting to see a muon. So in here, this outgoing muon provides a very clean signature of the process. So you send a neutrino of the muon, comes out a muon. Now, in this event here, it's not a, a muon that comes out as expected. It's an electron that comes out. And this was funny. So this indicates that there is another process indeed, that is this one. So the neutrino interacts, remains neutrino. But there is here an object that is exchanged that is not the photon. It's something similar, but it's the Z0. Interacts with the electron. So I have an interaction that is called neutral current, because this Z0 has no current. So this was, this were the main, among the main experimental results that were on the basis of the model proposed by, initially by Glarsho, and then finalized by Weinberg and Salam. And that is the model of the unification of electromagnetic and weak interactions. And 
and the basic thing in this model is to recognize that there is a, a very that electromagnetic interaction and this neutral current are very very similar look at these graphs they look very similar here i have an electron interacting and an electron exchanging a photon here well it's not an electron it's a neutrino interacting with an electron exchanging a z0 that's also a neutral object so the only thing that is different is that the strengths, the intensity, the probability of these two interactions is totally different. So this is much more probable to occur. And an inter interaction of a neutrino, there's a very small probability, as, as we know, because it traverses neutrinos, traverses matter with all uh, very easily. So why the probability is so low for the weak and large for the, for the electromagnetic? Well, I could say because the charges involved are different, no, here the explanation is was the, the, the one in fundamental aspect of the model. The probability is smaller because the Z is massive and the photon has no mass. So and in quantum field, field theory, the probability of exchanging an object of zero mass as the photon is much larger than exchanging one with mass. So. But at when this happened, this was 68, 67, 68, these bosons, Ws and Zs, that are fundamental, were not discovered. Nobody had seen them. So these were just elements in the theory. How can we produce these, these bosons? Because people, with, based on the experimental results, they could compute, and with this model, weinberg salam model, expect masses around 80, 90 GeV. That means 80 or 90 times more the mass of the proton. So you need a lot of energy to produce those if you want to, to produce them in accelerators. So this is where the colliders came. So, the why co so we have two types of experiments, Fi what we call fixed target experiments. So we have a beam, the beam is ejected trans so uh, along the, the tangent to the to the accelerator and goes over a target, a block of matter. But we can do also, uh, we can make two beams collide, so uh, beams uh, rotating in uh, opposite sense make them collide. Why? Because the energy that is available to produce particles in the beam, in the fixed target experiment is given by the square root of two times the energy of the beam times the mass of the proton. So, and in the other case, the energy of that we call the energy of the center of mass, the energy available to produce new particles is two times the energy of the beam, is the sum of the, the energy of the two beams. So, and you can understand why this is. Wha I mean, if you have two, two particles that go in opposite side, so the system, the system itself, the sum of the two velocities is zero because they are opposite sides. So there is no kinetic energy. So all the kinetic energy, boom, and here at all this energy at this point is used to create new particles. When you have a fixed target experiment, what you have is this at rest, the particle comes, it creates some energy, but there is a lot of energy still that is en kinetical energy of the movement of the system that continues. So that's why a beam-beam interaction produces is much more effective in creating new, par new particles. Of course, it's much more complicated to collide two beams than to send a beam over a block of matter, because these beams are tiny. They, they have microns of uh, thickness, so you have to have these things very well aligned with in the magnet so that the beams really collide. So, um, but, but uh, one of the places where this was done was at CERN, and uh, was Carlo Rubia, the future no Nobel laureate, that uh, proposed to transform an existing accelerator at CERN to a proton-antiproton collider. It was, uh, of course, it was necessary to produce uh, protons, but with this, he could get enough energy to produce, to create in the lab, to create at CERN in his experiments Ws and Z. So this is uh, here on the left is one of the f these first collisions. So you have two a proton and antiproton colliding here. There are many particles produced, but among them there are these E plus E minus, an electron and a positron that goes in opposite direction, very energetic, and the sum of the energies of this electron and positron gives the the energy of the Z0, the mass of the Z0. So this was the first experiment where these things were observed. So putting all together, 
So we have now this uh, standard model of elementary particles. The table, so again, uh, this is a still a, a different form, but I have here the same three families, the quarks on top, the leptons on bottom, and the gauge uh, mediators of the interactions, the gamma, the gluons, the Z0, and the Ys, and, and you have very simple, very elegant equations that uh, describe the behavior of these interactions. And this model reproduces very well all the measurements. So this, I don't know if you can read on the screen the numbers, but these are different measurements. Don't, don't worry what, what the measurements are. But the important thing is that the measurement, the the, 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 these numbers in this middle column are, is what is measured, plus or minus an error. So every measurement has an error. And the right column is what the theory predicts. And you see how well these numbers match. And they match at a level of 1% or below in precision. So the model is good. The model is good, but still, a funny thing happened in the way of building this theory. Something is missing. Something is missing because these nice equations that I, w that I was showing, they, they only make sense if all the bosons, all the quarks, all the leptons had no mass. And if these particles have no mass, they move at the speed of the light. So a particle without mass moves at the speed of light. It's not possible to imagine a universe with everybody moving at the speed of light. It's a bit hard to, to figure out. So that's where the Higgs field came. And so the Higgs field was introduced to give mass to these particles. So the mass results from the interaction of all the particles with the Higgs field. <laughs>